thank you all for allowing me to listen to you uh, and to have a bit of a conversation because we're all here because we know um, something big is about to happen, uh, meaning that we as a nation are finally going to address this issue of jobs, clean energy jobs, climate change, and making our nation number one again in terms of investment, right? So it's, um, I'm really thrilled to be here because we want these jobs not just to be any jobs. We want them to be union jobs. We want them to be high paying jobs. We want to address equity. And this is why I wanted to hear, we wanted to hear from you. So on behalf of Joe Biden, who is the most pro union labor president you are ever going to see. I know you know him, and he is he's serious about it. And so on all of the um, investments that hopefully will be flowing soon, you will see that there is a commitment to making sure that union labor is created. So it's really exciting. So you're aware, of course, that uh, what was negotiated with in a bipartisan way um, this past week, I'm sure you saw, it is amazing. It is uh, an historic investment, for example, in bridges. You know, we have 46,000 bridges that are in poor condition. An historic investment. An historic investment in rail since Amtrak. The biggest investment in rail since Amtrak came on uh, line. The biggest investment in internet that every family, every house will have access to high-speed internet in this package is historic and historic investment in um, transit, uh, which is amazing, uh, and historic investment in water, in making sure the pipes that lead to homes and schools don't have lead in them so we're not poisoning our children, and historic investment in electric vehicles uh, and the infrastructure associated with that, the charging stations, and an historic investment in the transmission grid, which is something I particularly uh, care about. So huge amount of uh, investment potential, 1.2 trillion over eight years. Um, so we just got to get it across the finish line. And then there will be part two, which is the reconciliation bill, which we hope also gets passed because of the infrastructure that's in there as well, the human infrastructure, the climate uh, commitments on policy to be able to create that pull of jobs to build the clean energy future that we know that uh, your members are all about. So I just, I'm really grateful to Climate Jobs New York for pulling this together because that's what we want to focus on at, at this particular moment. This is being live streamed, um, so your comments will be heard and appreciated, I know, by those who are following this issue of, of clean energy jobs. Um, you are aware, I'm sure, at least I am aware, and I say it all the time, so I hope you're aware, and if you're not, I hope you use it. Um, $23 trillion market globally for clean energy, for the products that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by the end of this decade. $23 trillion global market. So the question for us is who's going to be building those products? Who's going to be installing those products? Are we going to just fold our arms and stand by the side of the road and watch other countries corner the market? Or are we going to get a share, more than a share? Are we going to lead? And this is why the president is saying, enough. We don't want our economic competitors to be taking this opportunity. We want to take this opportunity. So it's our moment to really make a difference for us. So, And we know, and this is part of what I want to ask you about, is that this will create, because the clean energy realm is so diverse, right? You all represent completely different pieces of it, all kinds of jobs for all kinds of people in all pockets of America. And that's really what I want people to understand is that this clean energy economy, yes, it is about um, putting solar panels on the roof, but it's about so much more than that. There's, it's so broad. And I think that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have this conversation. And us. Uh, 90% of the jobs that will be created from the, the American Jobs Plan that the President has proposed are jobs that do not require a college uh, degree. So this really means it's accessible to people and that we really can uh, crack the code on, you know, collapsing uh, the inequality that exists uh, right now. So bottom line, I'm excited to, to hear from you. So if I can, I've got a, like a question for each of you. And, uh, and if it's all right, maybe I can just get started. Is that all right Sounds with you? Perfect. Yeah. All right, Gary, yes. 
and, and for those who are watching, President of New York City and New York State Building Trades Council, Mr. President. I have a great boss that I call Mr. President too, but I'm glad that you are here. Yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, obviously labor has been yeah. such a, a key player in driving climate action in New York, mm -hmm. um, which is great. And of course, we want that to be the case throughout uh, the entire clean right. energy transformation in other places as well. Can you talk, uh, say a word about why it's so important that labor plays a leading role on, on climate and what uh, steps would you recommend um, create to uh, in creating project labor agreements? Uh, yeah, say a word about that, that. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary, and, and thank you for being here and convening us together today. So um, to answer your question, let, let, me, let me just kind of give you a little brief, I'll keep this as brief as I can, not to dominate too much time, but a little bit of history about climate jobs in New York, and frankly, there are climate jobs throughout the country now. Um, and we actually have a national educational program as well. Uh, this all began several years ago based on an academic study by Cornell University, a professor there, Lara Skinner, uh, pr came to us with a, a study about um, climate change, renewable energy and jobs. And what we saw at that time, this is several years ago based on the study, is that clearly this is going to be an emerging and massive industry. However, there are really no real job standards or were no real job standards at that time. So we saw this as an opportunity where labor must be at the table and obviously we began and everyone obviously on this uh, panel today was in the formation of Climate Jobs New York, we realized that labor really needs to drive the conversation uh, about the connection between an emerging industry, which is going to be a massive industry, uh, addressing climate change, but in the in, in, at the same time, simultaneously, we need to create good, strong middle class careers, not just jobs, yes, but careers yes, yes. in this industry. So we got very active, and what I will say essentially is, over after two years of work, we just did something this year in the in the budget. Um, we had the governor's support, and we also had the legislature's support in in terms of moving forward, codified into statute, the requirements for large scale renewables over five megawatts or more that they would require prevailing wages. Mm -hmm. They would require project labor agreements. So that takes care of the construction. What we also did, because there are going to be permanent jobs here in the area of O&M, operations and maintenance, <clears throat> more difficult to require prevailing wage there, or, or PLAs don't apply because it's not construction. But we, we got in codified into law that all developers, contractors involved in this work will have to engage in labor peace agreements and card check neutrality. We feel this is a very, uh, this is an industry that's very, very open to being organized, and we did not want interference. Beyond that, going to your points earlier about the President's thoughts and comments, we put into this legislation, buy American for iron and steel, so mm -hmm. that you have to buy American iron and steel, and also a very large incentive, an economic incentive for the develop for developers, and I know Bob Master may speak to this on the manufacturing component, to buy from New York manufacturers yeah. for components. So we think these four fundamental issues address the importance and really support the concept that when you're going to have this massive industry and this massive job creation, these can't be low road jobs. These have to be family sustaining jobs, careers, that means union jobs. Mm -hmm. We all know that around this table. So that's what we did, and we intend to carry this model to as many states as we can. And certainly, our, you know, our thought process is, and we're so happy that you're here, is to have the conversations yeah. with you and others so that we can see this take place even at the federal level, that requirements are put right, in there right. with the acknowledgement that this is going to be, you said it, trillions of dollars of, of opportunity. But that opportunity must not only build an infrastructure, it must build strong middle class careers and communities. And we believe we can do that and labor can drive that, that message. So those four things could be a model for what the federal government We feel that that makes perfect looking sense. At. Yes, honestly, yes, yeah. Madam Secretary. Um, I'd love to get a cop. I, the study that you talked about was from I'll when? I'll be happy to get it. It was actually in 2017, 2017. 2018. And it, it actually showed that the vast majority of work that had been done 
was all non-union and low road jobs. Yeah. And there were a lot of wage theft issues. So we knew that we have to address it. Labor has to have a voice and have to drive this. Okay. So All right. I'm happy to make sure we get you that. Yeah, I'd love to get to it. Thanks for Absolutely. thanks for that. I'm taking notes, so okay. I appreciate it. I'm going to turn Thank you very um, much. over here. Um, Vinny Alvarez is the president of the New York City Central Labor Council, the AFL-CIO. Mr. Yep. President, as well, um, surrounded by presidents. I love it. And given your leadership position with the with the AFL. And you're, um, you, you are an IBEW I am. member, right? Long, years. For how long? 30, 31 years. 31 years, all right. So you, you bring a, a great perspective on a, on a variety of industries, including clean energy, obviously, sure. with that. Um, so New York has set a 100% um, clean energy standard by 2040, mm -hmm. I think. And I'm wondering if you can link that kind of a standard, because President Biden has set a clean energy standard that he hopes to be able to get through this reconciliation bill 100% by 2035. Talk, if you can, about the job creation that could flow from that uh, demand pull. Well, it's enormous. And well, first, let me just say, your opening remarks with some of the similar things and similar sentiments that we've all been saying around this table for a lot of years. So it is great to have you here, Madam Secretary, and, and hear you say the things that we've been advocating and pulling for. With respect to the jobs, we've been, um, we have been fighting, we, we have been saying from the beginning, as Gary mentioned, this is uh, addressing a dual crisis, the crisis of both inequality through the creation of good jobs and the crisis of climate change. And we see them um, both not in conflict, but complementing each, each other when we are, uh, are building a new sector. The clean energy sector is enormous and emerging sector, and it's going to be growing for several decades now. And we either can get it right, and we can create these, uh, we can create not just uh, low wage, short term, uh, uh, low income jobs, but long term careers with family sustaining wages and good union jobs. Uh, that has become even more important after the pandemic that we've seen with the economic crisis we've lost. We're still down about 450,000 jobs here in New York City and throughout our state. So now more than ever, we want to make sure that we're creating good jobs, but it's important to make sure that they're good, high paying uh, jobs with, with labor standards. Uh, we, we really think that if we look at, and Gary referenced the study, the study said, let's take a look at, at the energy sector, the building sector, the transportation sector, and just transition for particularly those industries that may be, uh, where there may be a transition required. And if we get this right, this could mean not only have, have, have dramatic impact on our economy, on the ability to create good jobs and help, uh, help create these career pathways for people, but can also be tremendously important for our economy here in New York State and throughout the region. This is the, uh, we see this as the birth of a new industry, yeah. and we could either get it right with support from the federal government and the Department of Energy and other agencies, or we can look back, you know, decades from now and say, you know, we had an opportunity and we missed it. And we are really just uh, inspired by the leadership of President Biden, of yourself and others who are speaking just openly and honestly about the need, yes, to create jobs, but not afraid to say that these need to be good union jobs because we know the difference in, in, in wages, in benefits, in safety, in retirement security, and we have a real opportunity to do that here. Well, we're we're excited about it. You know, we're yep. like we just want to make this happen so um, I immediately. Like we want the first part of this bill to be in the next couple of weeks. We want the second part of the bill at, to be before, you know, they come back in the fall or you know before the fall. Uh, we it's got to happen because this is the year that we can put this. Uh, funding out that we can get people to work. We're on the backside of this pandemic, as yep. you say. Let's build back better. That's what it's That's all right. about. Uh, so excited to be a partner with you in that. Um, Jim, let me let me go to you because you're next on my card. I'm not I'm not skipping over you for whatever reason. We've got you the best for last, Lenore. So <laughs> so so just letting you know, just letting you know. So Jim, um, obviously utility workers going to be key partners as as we know in this effort. Um, I'm wondering if you can share a bit of the feedback from your from your uh, membership about maybe both what excites them about having a clean energy standard like as robust as what the president wants to do by 2035 and maybe maybe share a little bit about what they're worried about. 
Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, Madam Secretary, first of all, uh, I want to thank you and the Department of Energy for all you've done for us and the uh, Utility Workers uh, Union of America and the administration. It is a breath of fresh air hearing this dialogue go on, and it's about time, right, in, yeah. in a way. Yeah. Um, you know, utility workers are in, a, in uh, a lot of parts of generation, not just from the nuclear area, but also the coal area. Mm -hmm. And it's exciting to know that there is uh, a future in some of these areas that we need it. But it's also very scary, right? Um, when we talk about transition, you know, a lot of folks are only talking about the energy piece of transition. Yeah. But the truly side of transition is worker, community, and that energy. Right, and, and it really has a big connection pieces of it. Um, too many times have we seen workers ending up where there's plant closure and there's no future. And that's not just impactful to the member, it's actually impactful to the family and the community. I've had members turn around and say, I can't send my daughter or son to college because I don't know where my future is. And we gotta stop that domino piece. We're, we're the United States of America. We are the best workforce out there. And our membership knows that. And they know they have served a lot of communities over these years in these great paying jobs, but actually raised families in these communities. And they want to continue striding forward in it. Now, they have made transitions before. Some plants have moved from the coal to the oil to the gas industry, and they can move into the newer area. But they want to make sure that they're sustainable jobs, they're good paying jobs. Right now, we see some of the solar industry right now with low scale paying jobs, where, where the profiteer is the corporation sides of it. Mm -hmm. We gotta make sure that we really hold on to those scale jobs, make sure that we're bringing the current workforce along with those new areas of, of exploration, but also grow in our younger generation. Mm -hmm. Start teaching it in the schools what the renewable sides are gonna be, no matter if it's a wind farm, solar, or battery storage. But we actually have to be investments in it. I'm excited about the news out in Wyoming where we're going to possibly see a nuclear power plant going yep. out there. Yep. we got to be able to actually have those conversations, but actually not just talk about that change of energy, talk about the workers, and bring them into the development. We want to make sure, though, in the utility workers, that when we're ready, when, they, when the new industry comes in, that we're prepared, we're ready for it, and we're skilled up on it. We want to make sure that we have training uh, classes for our current workforce and for our future workforces. We want to make sure that we have the top of the line, that it's not a day when the industry opens up and then says, okay, where's our workforce? We want to be ready. Right. And everybody here at this table has always committed ourselves to making sure the apprenticeship programs, to making sure our training programs are top of the line, and making sure that we're ready when the industry lands and ready to move mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. Well, that I mean, it's great to hear uh, this issue about the transition is a hard issue, right? I mean, it's really hard for people to imagine themselves. They've, you know, the irony is that people have been powering this country for a hundred years, and these are good jobs, and we want them to power this country for the next hundred years. And it may be a different type of power, but we want them to see themselves in it. And they're only going to do that if we get the investments here, and it, if particularly in the communities that are at risk of losing something. So this administration, I know you know, everybody here knows, we are committed to the um, helping these communities in particular move to the types of energy that we know are gonna be in demand globally, like hydrogen, like um, the and laying the pipes for that hydrogen, like CCS, and like nuclear too, and keeping the power plants that exist open. I know here in New York, you guys just had one that was that was closed down, but you know, nuclear provides right now over 50% of our clean energy. If we're gonna get to this goal, we've gotta keep all of these clean technologies going. And even the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said, you know, we can't get there unless we have these technologies in addition to bringing on new uh, renewables. So it's a, you know, carbon management is an important piece of that. So thank you. Thanks for that. And thanks for your, you know, great leadership on it. Um, Henry, I'm going to bop over to you. Um, the executive director of AFSME District Council 37. Um, so we're pushing for these in infrastructure um, investments on the federal level. It means we're going to increase union membership. I want, given your leadership, I'm wondering if you can um, give me some advice about what you want to see the federal government, uh, what steps you want to see us take to make the biggest impact. 
So let, let me start by thanking you for being here, for listening, and thanking the administration for turning the page on what should be uh, one of the most important questions of our generation. Um, let me just say that we had the <laughs> dubious distinction of uh, having been affected as essential workers here as having lost 162 members ah. who perished as a result of COVID-19 for having to deliver the essential services every day. How many? 162. Mm. Um, and they work in the schools, they work in libraries, they work in public hospitals, they work in all kinds of jobs. Um, they're mostly people of color who were hit disproportional by the COVID-19 and have been hit disproportional by um, uh, the climate inequality. If there's one thing that was probably most troubling to me as part of being in the transition of reopening the city, uh, the committee that reopened the city, was to see the statistics that showed that within 20 zip codes here represented almost 62% of all the deaths wow. uh, within COVID. Our members who have, most of them have residency requirement, live in these communities and were affected by that community. And if you keep going down that road, it wasn't just poverty or income that determined their death, it was the quality of air mm. and life in those very neighborhoods. Uh, the high propensity of asthma and diabetes and other things. So from the perspective of our members who are there, uh, I just want to say that this is something that we are you know, so embedded to, that we're so committed to because it's their lives, the livelihood. They have, you have 15,000 people living in federal uh, public housing right now and led uh, as well as uh, a lot of other environmental issues was affected them tremendously. And so I think that the federal government uh, could, you know, turn this into a win-win-win situation. And I say one win-win situation for the following. Not only create good paying jobs, as my colleague said here, uh, the presidents, I have the distinction of not being one, I'm executive director, but I'm a troublemaker by profession, so that's, <laughs> that's actually my real title. That's what we good jobs, with good paying jobs, not careers that could lead to it, good environmental conditions for the people. But also on the third win, I say, I sit as a, a pension trustee, uh, and so we invest uh, inst as institutional pensions, we invest trillions of dollars. There's more than $10 trillion invested uh, in various you know, different industries, and we're divesting from fossil fuels and investing into green renewable energy. Unfortunately, because we don't have the infrastructure here in this country to invest, um, we invest more money in Germany than we do in downtown Brooklyn. What? And so those jobs, instead of being here, mm -hmm. I go overseas, no disrespect to our brothers in Germany, but I'd rather have yeah. a kid from Brooklyn take a good paying job and a career, right? So we're prepared to put our money where our mouth is, not just follow the, 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 the lead of the federal government, but we need the infrastructure there to do so. And so I think that from our perspective, if you could tie in the jobs to the pensions, to the environmental community, to the community that we represent in terms of improving the environmental conditions, I think that would be a win-win win situation. I think that you've already started by taking the leadership and saying this is what we need to do. And it takes both steps. It takes risks. But in the, in the end, there will be the rewards there. And I think that we could be helpful by being partners uh, and not being obstructionist, but really create good paying jobs for the community we represent. We're talking about the air conditioning. I was at a school this morning, sweltering heat, mm. 106 degrees, cooking for the kids and the adults, um, because that's what they're doing now. And there was no Come air on. conditioner. We had fans that were just blowing hot air. And I asked a question to the principal who I, I love, she's really great. I said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a plan that we can connect the solar carbonization to the air quality right here in the cafeteria? And she said, you're telling me I'm fanning with a little piece of paper. So this is the kind of stuff for the children that were there, for the workers that were there, that the federal government could really help us mm -hmm. with. And really think about the workers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to thank you for listening and look forward to any partnership we can have. Oh my goodness, Henry, what a powerful series of statements were in that, um, including 
you know, what is the administration going to do on schools and retrofitting uh, schools and and obviously with HVAC, but also with um, clean energy, whether it's solar and buses that are not running on diesel, but are running on, on batteries, on electricity. So totally uh, agree on the health benefits and on your um, flagging the environmental justice component of things. You know, we, we spent this morning um, talking with Uprose uh, and they are, you know, the whole offshore wind thing that they are partnering with the city and the state on and, and are leading. And they're, you know, the city and state are listening to the community, the leaders in the community to see what needs to happen. And I think that partnership with communities that are most effective and have been negatively affected by the negative impacts of pollution um, are the ones that need to be at the front of the line. And that's what the president has been saying too, is that 40% of the benefits of all of these investments or the investments themselves have to go into communities um, that have been disproportionately negatively affected. That means communities that are in transition and that means communities largely of color um, and who are in, on the front lines of, of the negative part of uh, carbon pollution. So thank you for raising that. And I love the idea of the pension leverage because uh, that's that could always good to come with a purse. <laughs> always good to come with a purse, no doubt, no doubt. All right, Bob Master, um, Bob, you're over here. Yes, Bob, um, political director of the Communication Workers of America District One. Um, thank you for for being here as well. So, you guys have members around the world uh, as well, and I'm wondering if you can say a word, perhaps. Um, and your being here reflects it, of the importance of solidarity among the labor community, uh, that this transition that we are making is a union-friendly transition. Say a word about that. Uh, sure, and again, I wanna echo everybody's uh, thanks to you for being here and for the administration's commitment to uh, all of the issues that we care so much about. And my being here is really uh, you know, an example of solidarity because uh, when Gary and, and Climate Jobs and uh, the labor movement was negotiating uh, with uh, Governor Cuomo over the, and, you know, the labor protections for operations and maintenance jobs, we came to the table um, because 20 years ago or so, we merged with the International Union of Electrical Workers uh -huh. and the IUE represents the 800 uh, workers who are left at the GE plant in Schenectady. And GE, as you know, is one of the leading manufacturers of offshore wind turbines. And we think there's a tremendous opportunity there. Uh, you probably know better than most people in America what deindustrialization means totally. to communities. And yep. Schenectady is more like Cleveland or Detroit than it is like New York City. You know, So we have an opportunity. We're getting full cooperation from the governor. We got the language because of the solidarity of the labor movement, language favoring uh, New York manufacture for uh, all these offshore wind turbines that are going to be deployed over the next 20 years. We need more help. Yeah. We need the administration to use its bully pulpit and its relationships with uh, companies like GE. GE was an iconic manufacturer like Ford or GM uh, that's now really dwindled uh, in the United States. But there's a tremendous opportunity here to rebuild, to onshore exactly. manufacturing again, exactly. high quality jobs in our communities and rebuild these communities. So, um, so that's, that's really you know, what we're looking at. at you know, and, and we think there's a real opportunity that GE may seize it, um, but we, we need as much help and as much advocacy as we can. I know that Climate Jobs uh, National Resource Center has prepared a memo um, detailing how uh, it might be possible to use to invoke the Defense Production Act yep. mm -hmm. and the uh, Bureau of Offshore Energy Management leasing process mm -hmm. uh, to leverage, you know, uh, domestic manufacturer and labor standards and things like that. So that, that's why we're here um, and we see a, just a tremendous opportunity uh, to revive American manufacturing in this sector. This is music, of course, to my ears, because I, I was I, I know that the president asked me to be energy secretary because of what Michigan went through when the auto industry collapsed, which is when I was governor, and how we had to rethink about, you know, we built the internal combustion engine. What what's next? You know, we have to diversify and we got to build car two point oh 
uh, which is the electric vehicle and the guts to that, which is the battery, and that means the whole supply chain. And if we, you know, if we don't do anything, we know that our economic competitors are going to take it, right? Right. GE, a great example, you know, GE should be building these turbines that we're talking about that meet yeah. the president's goal of getting, you know, 30 gigawatts of offshore wind, right, along the Atlantic. That should be that should be a no-brainer. And the president is totally committed to buy American, to your point. I mean, he wants to see at every level, including all the supply chains for these products as well. You know, it's it's crazy. We're importing uh, I mean, you know, great for the for the, the you know turbines that are built in Denmark. That's great. The Europeans, that's wonderful, they're ahead. And you know, but we want to be building that. And we, yeah. you know, I used to joke all the time, look at those wind turbines, they got brakes, they have drive trains, they, right. you know, Michigan, we do that in cars, you know, it's just a lot bigger. Let's just make that stuff here in America. So I really appreciate what you're saying and the solidarity that yeah. that uh, reflects. So, uh, we gotta do this, <laughs> okay. Um, all right, Justin, um, you are uh, a member of IBEW Local 3, and you are an electrician. Um, so, so here we go. Electricians and journeymen um, are going to be in high demand, we hope, right? That's the demand. That's the hope here. Um, I want you to uh, say a word from your perspective about why these should be union jobs. Well, as, uh, well first, thank you for being here. And hearing your opening remarks about investing in the infrastructure and bringing these jobs to New York is important to me especially because I've been on these jobs. Uh, we were taught, to speak to Jim's point, about teaching the next generation these classes. As apprentices, that's exactly what they do for us. We, we have courses such as renewable energy where they teach us how to assemble these products and a class G Pro where we're taught the, how important it is to reduce the carbon footprint. And uh, since being a journey person, for two years we've installed, we've done over 100 installations. For as small as four kilowatts on a single family residential home to the installation on our own training center. Where not only we were taught the, how to do it, now we were putting it on our own training center, That's which cool. was a 40 kilowatt, 160 huh. panels. So I'm, as a young journeyman, I, it's exciting to hear because I like to continue doing this for another 30, 30 years that's left in my career. And uh, for my younger brothers that are in it, you know, to sh keep this going, yeah. to invest right here. That's uh, exactly what we want to do. We want to get a whole slew of people like you working. Yep. Good careers, lifelong careers. That's exactly what we'd like. All right. So um, let me go to um, Chanel. You are a science teacher and a sustainability coordinator at um, Intermediate School 68 in Brooklyn. Is that right? Yes. Did I get that right? So I know um, being a science teacher, I'd love to hear, because you bring a different, you're wearing a different hat than the rest of the folks around here. Um, the Carbon Free and Healthy Schools Program. What, what would that mean for you and your students? Okay, so it is a pleasure meeting you, Madam Secretary, and I was, pleased to hear your opening remarks regarding improving conditions in our schools, having clean air and clean water for our students. So um, we have, many New York City schools have implemented sustainability programs. We are moving towards teaching our kids about caring for the environment. We have implemented vegetable gardens in our um, schools. We, uh, recite, we have implemented a recycling program. We've taught our kids about the importance of conserving energy. But um, this is simply just not enough. We've reached the point where we need to, our schools, the infrastructure of our schools need to reflect what we're teaching our mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. There needs to be practical application of clean energy technology in our schools. We need to, when we sit in our school buildings, we need to be reassured that we are breathing in clean air, we are drinking clean water. Our students are already facing, you know, a lot of adversities in many aspects of life. So um, carbon-free schools means a whole lot to our community. We are educating our students to be stewards of the environment. We are teaching our students, we are, 
the future workforce. So we need to serve as role models in our community by implementing clean energy technology. We have our school rooftops that can be used for solar power. We will serve as role models to the community. When community members see that our schools are teaching our kids about clean energy and actually implementing clean technology, our community members will follow. We're also teaching our students about future jobs. Maybe our students want to work in, in um, clean technology in, in the future. So um, it means a whole lot to us in terms of educating the workforce and caring for our environment. We're teaching our students to be stewards of the environment. All right, so that is, um, you, we have to model the way. And if the schools don't reflect what you're teaching, then you're not, you're, it's, uh, it's hypocrisy a bit, right? Or at least it's not delivering the right message. So um, Richard, you are the vice president of the UFT, the United Federation of Teachers, and I know obviously this has been a focus of yours on a broader on a broader scale. I wonder if you can um, say a word, uh, you know, from your perspective about this uh, carbon-free and healthy schools, and um, and what it, what your long-term and your short-term uh, goals are. Sure. Um, let me thank you for joining us today, and let me start by saying. Uh, Big Wolverine fan. You are. <laughs> my wife's a, okay. my wife's a Michigan graduate. I have no choice. <laughs> go blue, go blue. <laughs> um, so um, so everybody raised excellent points. Kind of stole my speaking points. Um, but um, to Chanel's point um, about teaching our kids um, and them living what they're learning, I uh, went to a school two weeks ago. Vinny actually joined me. Uh, PS sixty two in Staten Island. The school was built from the ground up to be carbon free. It's one of two schools in the country that's net zero. From the solar panels on the roof, solar panels over the uh, parking structure, um, thermal wells to heat and cool the building, uh, paving stones and a schoolyard that collects rainwater that they use in the building, to uh, smart lighting that goes on and off when you're in the room. Um, better, no offense, it's not fluorescent, it's actually brighter, it makes you feel better, which impacts learning. Um, it was, a, it was a great visit, like, and the kids were happy to be there, and that was my takeaway. When we left, we, before we left, rather, we, we spoke to a bunch of the students, and every one of them was truly an ambassador about, like, clean and green, like, every one of them. Every student had a story. Um, there was one a girl, the parents took her on vacation to a, a beach. She spent the entire week cleaning garbage off the beach because she's, they do it in school. They're always cleaning up. They're always recycling. It's, it's important. They were saying when they go home, you know, they yell at their parents if their lights are left on in the room um, about how important it is to recycle. So yes, you know, it'll create great union jobs for many years to come. It'll help the environment for many years to come. But it's building a future, right? It's building a future of, of inhabitants of this planet that are going to care for it. They're going to take care of it. And look, as Chanel said, there's 1,800 schools in New York City. Each and every one of them could use some sort of upgrade. Um, and this is just a, a great, we'd like to see this done in every building, whether it's improved ventilation, um, whether it's solar panels on the roof, uh, air conditioning, 25% of our classrooms don't have air conditioning. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, a day like today, I mean, you could, couldn't right. be in a classroom. No right. um, so, I mean, our, our long-term vision is to see every school improved. Look, New Yorkers have a lot of opinions. I'm sure you heard that before, right? <laughs> but this is one area. Who doesn't want clean and healthy schools? Right. Right. It's, it's an issue we can all rally around. Totally, totally. Thank you for your leadership on that. And I'm envious on Chanel's part for what you, I mean, what, you're, you, you were at 60, what were you at? What was the school number? 60. I'm a graduate of the school she teaches. Really? <laughs> but what school were you at, though? IS 68. You were at. Oh, PS 62. I'm 62. sorry. I misunderstood you. Can we get 68? And you're at 68. Oh. Can we get a little bit of 62 over to 68 and try to, and, and you wonder, I mean, it is, there's an issue, right, of, um, and this is a great segue, Lenore, of uh, environmental justice, right, and making sure we are getting all these schools, no matter where they are, to have the same opportunities, right? 
Um, Lenore, I know, you know, this question about environmental justice and how, um, how we can make sure that this clean energy transition really is just and that the benefits are spread in an equitable way. And I wonder if you can comment on that from your perch. Sure. And, and I just, I got to say for the, for everybody, she's an officer at SEIU Local 32 BJ. Thank you, and thank you for joining us, and we're happy to um, host this. I'm assistant to the president here at 32BJ. Um, and I do think one of the exciting things about this coalition of labor unions um, is that we have that commitment to environmental justice. So whether it's the offshore wind that we're working uh, together on to try to get built, um, maintained, and the manufacturing for it produced by um, uh, union workers good create good union jobs or it's the carbon free and healthy schools campaign that we're also working on to not only make sure that we're moving towards renewables but that we're actually dealing with all of the physical issues in the buildings um, we have also come together in support of prioritizing um, creating good jobs for people who have been left out, whether that's communities of, of color, uh, workers who've been laid off, workers, as in Jimmy's case, um, that have been displaced, that the exciting thing about the opportunity is, and a little bit to piggyback on what Vinny uh, was saying, that we have the opportunity in addressing climate change in a way that reduces economic inequality and that reduces racial disparities, that takes on the historic discrimination by creating more good jobs and by prioritizing jobs and by creating pipelines and opportunities for workers in communities of color, low-income workers, and workers who um, maybe have been displaced by COVID and the COVID crisis. So um, what we're actually, you know, thinking about and urging the administration is to go big, to be bold, to go big, that, you know, whether it's people in Portland, Oregon, who are frying eggs on their balcony by putting a frying pan out because the temperatures are so crazy, or the horrendous building collapse in Florida that, you know, Every day we're confronted by new infrastructure crises. The need is there, the need for clean, uh, clean water, um, clean air to eliminate the pollution that creates asthma. And, and um, the need is there. And the question is, can we meet the moment and do it in a way that really moves us towards justice? And, and creating good union jobs is one piece of it, um, and creating opportunities and avenues um, for communities of color, for um, workers who've been displaced, and to prioritize communities that have been historically dependent on fossil fuel. We can't, as Jimmy mentioned, we can't just um, think about moving to renewables without thinking about the impact on those communities. So targeting those communities that have been historically dependent on fossil fuels for investment are things that are, are really, really critical. So that eye to equity is really important in how we build and how we uh, how we grow. Thousand percent. Thank you for that. I mean, the president created an intergovernmental work group on coal and power plant communities for the reason that you've described. We don't want to leave them behind. And the, the president has committed this environmental justice 40 percent because we don't want to leave people behind. He's so, um, you know, I, the president, as you guys know, I, who know him, you know, he's, in it, he's, a, he's a faithful man. And part of his faith tells, tells him that you know, we're not going to leave people behind, that we're here for the least of these, and we're here for all. And um, I feel it's a privilege to have a great boss. <laughs> and, and I mean, just one additional point, which is, I think, to think about what people need holistically. Yeah. And it was really great to hear you talk about um, both the infrastructure plan and the reconciliation. And I think, you know, one of the things that is disturbing is how many women are out of work. Um, and that really draws attention to the importance of child care, of uh, senior care, of thinking about yes. all of that as part of, of really creating good jobs and thinking about all of the jobs that are really needed. So um, we want to make sure that women aren't left out. Yes. Um, and men who are caretakers aren't right. left out. And, right. you know, and so we're thinking about all of um, all of infrastructure in its broadest sense right. and, and how we take that on. Yeah, and he, and totally agree. And that's what the plan is. Of course, you, you started by saying we got to go big. And he has put out a big plan. And now it's our job, I think, to keep all of our, our, um, 
our family in the tent. <laughs> you know, that we get this across and that there's a sense of bigness and of urgency, that we don't want to wait beyond, uh, you know, these next couple of months to get this through, because we'll have a lot of work to do, right, to get, this, to get this going. So there's a sense of urgency, there's a sense of this is a moment that we have right now to be able to get this through and it's got to be big and it's got to be meaningful and it's a moment where we can really tip the scales back in in the favor of american workers so i'm 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 thrilled to be here uh, on behalf of the president of the united states thank you so much for your commitment to making this happen here in new york and your leadership uh beyond new york and um you know on behalf of 330 million people who live in this country thank you Let's do this. All right. Thanks, you guys.